Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for being here for this year's celebration of World IP Day. Uh, my name is Vince Garlock. I'm the executive director of the American Intellectual Property Law Association. For those of you unfamiliar with AIPLA, we're a national bar association founded about 125 years ago with practitioners that represent both owners and users of IP. World IP Day, as you know, was established over two decades ago by the World Intellectual Property uh, organization has been celebrated across the globe every year since. We are very excited not only to be raising awareness about, uh, about the impact and importance of intellectual property, uh, but also celebrating women in the intellectual property field this year. This year's global theme, Women in IP, Accelerating Innovation and Creativity, and how timely, and you will hear, uh, you will hear reports of uh, some of the studies done by both the Copyright Office and the USPTO, which, thing, which shows that things are improving. However, as you probably know, there's so much more work to do. We need to celebrate and acknowledge, recognize the advancements of famous uh, inventors, not only famous inventors like Hedy Lamar, the actress who was also in, an inductee into the National Inventors Hall of Fame, but also songwriters, creators, photographers, graphic artists, and including the some of the great innovators you'll hear from today. But before we uh, begin, we have a very special guest. I want to ask Chris Katopas from the ABA IPL section to do the introduction. Thank you, Vince. I'm Chris Katopas, and on behalf of the American Bar Association Intellectual Property Law Section, it's a great pleasure to be part of this annual tradition. The ABA has been advocating for strong IP laws since 1880. And it's just a delight. And we thank our hosts, uh, the USPTO, AIPLA, the Copyright Office, WIPO, everyone for making today's event possible. It's a great pleasure to be able to introduce our first speaker. 25 years ago, I was a young Hill staffer working for a member of Congress from Riverside, California, who built a career on intellectual property. And we had a young California entrepreneur come to our office. And we knew this man was gonna set the world on fire. Two years later, he's a member of Congress. And today I get to introduce him. So it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce Congressman Chairman Daryl Issa, who represents the people of California's 48th Congressional District. The 48th District encompasses the central and eastern parts of San Diego County and a portion of Riverside. Originally from Ohio, Isa enlisted in the U.S. Army when he was a senior in high school and was later commissioned as an Army officer, ultimately obtaining the rank of captain. He completed his active duty military service in 1980 and turned his interest to the private sector. Chairman Isa served as the CEO of the California-based electronics company that he founded and he built in the 1990s which became the nation's largest manufacturer of vehicle anti-theft and auto security devices. In 1994, he was named Entrepreneur of the Year. During that time, he also served as chairman of the Consum Consumer Electronics Association. Chairman Issa, the senior member of the House Judiciary Committee and House Foreign Affairs Committee. Most notably, he is the current chair of the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Courts the internet and intellectual property. And also of particular note for this audience, he is the holder of 37 US patents and is personally familiar with the importance of intellectual property rights and what it means to businesses, small and large. Well, you know, one thing you know as a, a member of Congress who just left a briefing on artificial intelligence. You know, artificial intelligence is generally here in Congress defined as what the staffer tells you to say that makes you look intelligent. You'll notice I don't have any notes, so that tells you how little you're going to hear of, of that. But I picked up this, uh, this little can, which we discussed that it cannot be reclosed, but I picked it up for a reason. The top on it, you can pop and open, without a can opener, or a church key as it was once called. The patent on that is probably in the two millions. It was still in force when I was a very young man. 
When I got my first patent, it was in the four millions. Only about two years ago, two and a half years ago, I was there when Raytheon was celebrated for the 10 millionth patent. But as the director will tell you, if you ask her for the numbers, I'm sure she has them off the top of your head, applications will be exceeding half a million this year. Granting will exceed, Madam Director, uh, 500,000, 400 and some thousand. Oh, we lost her. Well, well, we, well, are we gonna hit the 400,000 now that, the things they hold on for the hearing. But we've been, we've been over a third of a million granted per year. That means every three years we'll hit a million. Now, my patents, my 37 patents, uh, plus the foreign ones have expired. But it is amazing that the in speed of innovation more or less has made nearly half of all the things ever invented to be currently in force. The speed of invention is amazing. The fact that uh, Huawei, a company who can't even sell in this country, came in number two in the number of patent or successes last year. Intellectual property is everything. It's everything in the current and it's gonna be everything in the future. So for those of us in Congress and those in the administration, it's incumbent that we get it right. That means patent quality, the day it leaves the patent office, has to be better. And for that matter, decisions on trademarks not turning into lawsuits after they're granted. And, and certainly the idea of whether copyright is real or recently produced by a computer. All of these and more are what is going to face all of us on both sides of the issue. Those who invent and those who have to deal with the cost of and the benefits of invention. We're seeing it as there is no such thing as a product that is patented in the future. There are, pat there are products that are multiple patents and those that are thousands of patents and maybe those that are tens of thousands of patents. And the complexity of that is going to change the adjudication. Now, tomorrow's discussion in the, uh, in the oversight hearing will probably have a lot to do with PTAB. And I just wanna take one moment of your time to tell you the vast amount of Article I judges who adjudicate those exceeds 100% of what would be the caseload of Article III judges today. So the idea that we could just ignore ex or inter party re-exam and, and move them all into the federal court and expect that load to be met by, the, by our judges simply doesn't exist. And as someone who has offered a bill two, three Congress, no, two Congresses ago, and is offering it again to expand the federal court that may or may not get you nearly 80 new judges in the next six years, I can assure you, if we want to have an understanding of what is patentable and what can be enforced and have it properly enforced by our court system, we're gonna to have to find every way to quickly create patent identity and certainty for all of us. So that's a little bit of what we're all going to be discussing both here and in committee and in every opportunity where I'm invited to go. Because the one thing I know is when we hit a million patents a year, no one patent will own everything. In most cases, it will be two, five, or even hundreds of patents that will be invested in almost everything we do and produce. And for all of us who have either been inventors or licensees, that means we've got to get what we're already doing better. And that's why it's kind of neat, if you don't mind, Vince, that I precede the undersecretary because on her shoulders falls a requirement to grow an organization out of her own funding, but also to grow an organization in concert with the future of uh, invention. And the future of invention is bright, perhaps so bright, that we need to work faster, better than we ever have before. So with that, Vince, thank you for letting me uh, I best basically introduce the director, uh, but I'll let you do the final introduction. But it is, it is something where I'm very proud that we have, I think, one of the best systems in the world. I think we lead the world, but quite frankly, the world is in competition and some of the countries would like to undermine our system and the only way for us to keep from being undermined is to work aggressively forward 
on being the country people look to as the gold standard for getting it right the first time and on those rare occasions where it's clearly wrong, fixing it and fixing it at a cost that is not too great to the plaintiff or the defendant. And with that, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, we will be getting to the director in a moment, but first, uh, I wanted to give a special thanks to our host for today's event, Senator Maisie Hirono from the great state of Hawaii. Uh, with us today is her counsel, John Conley. John? Thanks, Vince. Uh, I am not Maisie Hirono. Uh, but thank you for that kind introduction. Um, Senator Hirono is very sorry not to be able to be here. She is, I believe, at, literally at this moment, objecting to a live unanimous consent resolution on the floor of the Senate. She would then join us later, except that she's going to a state dinner tonight. So uh, unfortunately, she's, she's not going to be here. Um, but she asked me to pass along some remarks. According to the PTO, IP intensive industries account for an astounding 41% of our domestic economic activity. That percentage is only growing and promoting innovation and creativity through strong IP protections is key to ensuring the US remains competitive in the 21st century. But right now, too many women, especially women of color, are not part of our IP systems, stifling our country's competitiveness. We must work to make sure that all segments of American society are participating in our creation and innovation ecosystem. This isn't just an American problem. According to WIPO and Invent Together, only 13% of investor, inventors listed on international patent applications from 1999 to 2020 were women. We don't know about the treatments for deadly diseases or advances in quantum computing or as yet unimaginable breakthroughs that we do not have because our patent system is not unleashing the collective brain power and creativity of women and girls. We wish we could give you precise data for here in the US, but right now the best we can do is guess a patent applic applicant's gender based on his or her name. And I'd be remiss if I didn't add that women of color are at the intersection of multiple underrepresented groups, and we are committing innovation malpractice by allowing them to remain largely shut out of our patent system. Understanding the scope of these problems is the first step in solving them, which is why I introduced the IDEA Act last Congress and plan to do so again this Congress. And of course, patents are only one part of the IP system that powers the larger innovation ecosystem. Women account for 38.5% of all copyright registrations, which represents great progress over the decades since the Copyright Act went into effect, but there's still more work to be done. Similarly, the share of trademarks registered by women has steadily increased over recent decades, but there remain great disparities. These are real problems that require hard work and real solutions. But we have reason for hope. We have more dedicated groups and leaders focused on these issues today than ever before. We're thrilled to be joined today by Director Vidal and Register Perlmutter. We're here to celebrate the role of the many, many women who do participate in and power our innovative and creative economy. I'm sorry not to be able to join you all today, but I thank the hosts, panelists, and all the attendees, and I'm proud to sponsor this important event. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I am Jenny Simmons, and I am with the International Trademark Association. Uh, we are a global association representing all the brands that you know and love. Chairman Issa, you know, picked up this bottle of water and talked about the patents that it might hold. But, you know, we all see a name brand here that we know and love, and I actually see a little R with a circle. So let us not forget how important trademarks are to our global economy. And it is my distinct pleasure to have the privilege to introduce Kathy Vidal to this group. I know we are going to hear some wonderful remarks from her as the leader of America's Innovation Agency. But just a, a brief moment to 
fully set the stage here. She began in this role in April of 2022, and she is the primary advisor, principal advisor to President Biden and um, through the Secretary of Commerce uh, on the domestic and international IP policy here in the United States. She is working to expand American innovation for and from all. She brings to impact so many different things in all of her activities, including serving as the vice chair of the Council for Inclusive Innovation, or CI Squared. Uh, she is a co-chair on the National Advisory Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship, or NACI, and is a co-founder of the Women's Entrepreneurship Initiative, or WE. She has played a role in advisory boards, including CHIPS, and other committees that are dedicated to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, I could go on and on. I have the most delightful role to introduce her, but I'm going to actually cut the remarks a little bit short so that we can have more time and hear about Director Vidal's priorities. Welcome to the stage, Director. Thank you, and uh, happy World IP Day 2023. It's so great. Uh, it was uh, a pleasure to follow uh, Representative Issa, given what's going to happen tomorrow, so looking forward to that. Um, I, I want to uh, tell you a quote and, and start my speech with a quote. Our nation is home to millions of, of, of inventors, and we must do more to encourage women and minorities to secure patent rights. To keep leading in technological innovation, we must harness the potential of all Americans. That was Senator Hirono. Uh, we heard remarks from her um, in a roundabout way, but we heard remarks from her this evening, um, and they still ring true. I want to thank the senator for her commitment to the IP ecosystem, so please convey that, to her commitment to expanding our IP ecosystem inclusively for the benefit of everybody in America, and for her supporting and sponsoring this World IP Day event. And I want to thank everybody in Congress for the unleashing America Innovators Act. That act demonstrates the commitment and belief of those in Congress to our intellectual property system. It demonstrates the belief that we have an intellectual property system that must serve the interests of our country and into which we will bring everyone. And if we do, we will drive economic growth, we will spur higher paying jobs, and we will foster national security. For Congress's belief that a strong and inclusive IP ecosystem is key to solving world problems and for some having money to put their kids through college. With your help in this room, we will be able to help many communities across our great nation have access to the innovation ecosystem from rural and military communities to those of tribal nations and native Hawaiians to those who identify as diverse or under-resourced, and to women. We know that when we meet people where they are with our pro bono services, which the USPTO does every single day, that we start to move toward parity. Focusing on women, because it is, we are celebrating women today, whereas only 12 to 13% of US inventors are women, when we meet women where they are with pro bono services, 43% of those who use our services are women. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> That's 12 to 13% to 43% based on one of our initiatives. Just one, and we have many. Why is parity important? I spoke this week at EarthX, and the way I described it is, if we look at all this great talent in the room, and we asked Vince to take one, Samantha to take two, Renee is one, Rachel is two, and went throughout the whole room, and then we said, all the twos, go sit on the sidelines. We would not be the nation we are today, and that is what we have done when it comes to innovation. Now, I wanna talk for a second, being where we are, about historical context. On April 10th, 1790, President George Washington signed our first patent act into law, allowing inventors to own the rights to their own inventions for a limited time. 
But it was not until May 5th, 1809, that Mary Dixon Keyes became the first woman to receive a US patent. Her invention was on a new method to weave silk into straw that was used primarily to make hats. Although it did not result in a financial windfall, it could have at the time, but it did not, her patent method was widely utilized and it was even praised by First Lady Dolly Madison. Today, 214 years later, more American women than ever have engaged in the innovation economy. In fact, women have represented the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs worldwide. And as you can tell from one of our recent studies on women in patenting, there's been an explosion of women, not only in more counties than ever before, but more women are patenting in counties around the world. But they only receive 2% of venture funding. And even with the explosion, the move toward parity has not made much progress. We must do better. We will do better. This is why the United States Patent and Trademark Office and the Department of Commerce launched our Women's Entrepreneurship Initiative. I launched it alongside uh, the Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo. This is an effort to help women navigate the IP ecosystem, to meet them where they are and bring them into the system. It identifies intellectual property challenges, helps them with intellectual property, helps them with financing, and helps them receive the mentoring and resources they need to survive and to thrive. We know that our world faces great challenges. We need all hands on deck, including especially women, to be inventing, to be starting companies, to be creating. It's not just a moral imperative, it is an international imperative. I love that the title of World IP Day is about accelerating innovation and creativity. Because right now we're doing a good job and the only way we accelerate it is to get more people into the ecosystem. And so that's why World IP Day focusing on women is about acceleration. We're working to accelerate them through our pro bono programs, through our recently introduced first time filer program where we're going to award patents more quickly to people new to the ecosystem who are under resourced. I could go on and on and um, I will in other contexts, so please stay tuned. Um, but we're, we're gonna make this happen, but we can't make it happen without you. So whether you're here and, and from Congress where you're passing bills to help us, or whether you're from the private sector or from organizations that we team with, I want you to all join us and make sure that we can move the needle in a really meaningful way this year. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Director Vidal. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Dana Kalaruli. I uh, serve a couple roles uh, in DC. I'm the executive director of the Licensing Executive Society, a uh, global organization about uh, 6,500 uh, professionals, both attorneys and uh, in-house counsel uh, who try to advance the business side of the IP. So that's the LES contribution. Um, uh, I formerly was at the US Patent and Trademark Office and always enjoyed celebrating World IP Day. Uh, in fact, so much so that I think I became the poster child for the inventor cards. Um, so uh, happy to be here today. Um, throughout my career, I have um, uh, worked with and for many impressive uh, uh, female bosses, um, including uh, the woman I'm, I'm introducing today. Um, uh, Register uh, Perlmutter uh, was appointed in October 2020 uh, as the Register of Copyrights. Uh, like Director Vidal, she also uh, has to balance two different roles in her position. Uh, one, uh, providing policy advice to Congress and to the executive branch on uh, the important provisions of the Copyright Act. Another, uh, managing uh, a 500 person organization uh, production system uh, to ensure that the IP system is working efficiently uh, and effectively. Uh, and, and, uh, and balancing those two roles, uh, uh, Register Perlmutter does a, a very excellent job. I uh, came to find that she was uh, knowledgeable in the roles that uh, I worked with her, thoughtful and insightful, and she continues to do that in her current role. And with that, uh, Shira. Oh, thank you very much, Dana. And I have to say, I'm just delighted to be part of today's celebration of World IP Day, always a highlight of the year. 
Uh, and it feels particularly timely to be addressing this year's theme of women in IP, uh, given that we just focused on these issues during Women's History Month, uh, so they're very much at the forefront. Uh, and the Copyright Office is part of a larger community, along with many of those in the room today, that is currently working to expand women's participation in the IP system. So let me first both applaud and echo uh, the remarks of Senator Hirono and Director Vidal, uh, who've stressed the importance of doing this. There is no question that society's progress in science and the useful arts will be faster and more striking with more contributions from those who've been underrepresented in the IP system, including women and girls. Now, there's good news to celebrate on this front, as well as real room for improvement. On the good news side, as you may have noticed, women are increasingly taking up leadership roles in the IP world. So here in DC alone, we have both of the dedicated IP agencies in the federal government headed by women, as well as a woman serving as the chief judge of the federal circuit. And at the Copyright Office itself, women make up 60% of our staff and two thirds of our senior management. Women are also increasing their levels of participation in the copyright system. Last year, the Copyright Office issued a report on women in copyright, noting a substantial gender gap in women authors' share of copyright registrations over a 42-year period. Uh, and as you heard, the overall average was 38%. And female creators accounted for a significantly lower share of copyright registrations than men in the same creative occupations. But the gap has been narrowing. And in fact, as of a couple of years ago, women have achieved parity in at least one category of important copyrighted works that is non-dramatic literary works. They're now just over 50% of all registrations. The Copyright Office is committed to improving the record for other categories of works as well and ensuring that more women are aware of and able to enjoy the benefits of copyright. And this includes a focus on enhanced outreach and education, working with partners in both the public and the private sectors, including at the Library of Congress, with women's membership organizations, and with the Patent and Trademark Office and the groups that are supporting this event today. More broadly, we're also collaborating with our counterparts in the United States and abroad to enhance diversity and inclusion with the goal of ultimately enriching culture and enhancing innovation. This includes working with WIPO, not only on substantive copyright issues, but also on economic analysis and on communications and education. And finally, as Director Vidal mentioned, uh, I have the pleasure of serving as a co-chair, a co-vice chair, sorry, of CI Squared, uh, the initiative led by the Department of Commerce through the PTO uh, to expand access to the innovative and creative economy for underserved groups, including women. So through all of these initiatives, we look forward to bringing more women to the copyright table and supporting them in all of their creative endeavors. So let me stop here and wish everyone a very happy and creative World IP Day. Hi, everybody. There are a lot more of you in the room than there were when I sat down. Um, Brad, are you in here somewhere? I think we're up, ladies. All right, Brad, you're now at the end. I'm going to introduce you and then um, turn it over to you, and then I'll come up when it's my turn. So thanks, everybody, for joining us this evening. My name is Samantha Aguayo, but you can call me Sam, and I am the Deputy Executive Director and Chief Policy Counsel for the Intellectual Property Owners Association, which many of you know as IPO. I am distinctly honored to, uh, to be joined by this impressive group of women and Brad um, <laughs> on the panel today. So I'm going to do very brief intros and then um, I'll come back um, about halfway through um, to uh, split the duties with uh, my friend Brad. So I don't think that you all are in the order that I have you on my list. So if you could just raise your hand when I say your name. Um, on our panel, we have Rachel Collar from General Mills, 
Renee Fossum from the Procter & Gamble Company, Rachel Lee from Bluefoot, Casey Boucher Williams from the Gentle Pit, um, Elizabeth Doherty from the USPTO, Maria Strong from the US Copyright Office, and last but not least, my co-moderator is my friend Brad Watts. After eight years on the Hill, most recently with Senator Tom Tillis of North Carolina, Brad is now the Vice President for Patents and Innovation Policy with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Global Innovation Policy Center. I'm going to turn the floor over to Brad to, to moderate the first half of the panel, and then I'll come back and uh, do the back half. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Sam. Uh, and fun fact, Sam and I are both from Alabama. We grew up apparently 20-ish, 30 miles from each other. So just goes to show you it's a small world. Um, I'm very thankful to be here today and to get to moderate a portion of this panel um, and to see so many good friends in the room. I was telling several folks in the back, um, this may be the biggest gathering of folks in our community in quite a while. I mean, it's kind of like a mini reunion. So it's so good to see so many people here supporting not only World IP Day, but um, supporting something I know that we all care about, which is inclusive innovation and making sure more Americans have an opportunity to do what we all know Americans do best, which is invent or create that next big thing. Um, so what I'd like to do before we get started um, with the dialogue is I'd like to have um, the wonderful women on this panel um, who are in the private sector, our inventors, our creators, to maybe do a bit more of a detailed introduction of themselves, tell us your story, your work um, in your companies um, or um, in your sphere and, and give us a sense of kind of who you are, how you got here and why IP is important to you. I think people would really benefit from hearing those stories. So uh, we'll start uh, at the head of the table and work our way down. Can you guys hear me? Is it good? So my name is Rachel Lee. I'm a co-founder and I call CETO, which is uh, executive um, Chief Executive and Technology Officer um, of Bluefoot. Um, I started my career as a computer scientist after college, so I coded a little bit. And then I uh, really wanted to kind of build my own specialty, um, kind of using my technical background. So that led me to uh, go to USPTO as a patent examiner. So I was an art unit, um, database art unit. I think it's 2,600. Don't call me on that. Um, so I was there and I did evening class as a GW law, like many other patent examiners. I went through the law school in the evening hours and um, it was a tough time, but you know, I got through. And at the time um, they had a reimbursement program for tuitions and I was counting on that, but that was taken away shortly after I arrived there. <laughs> but I heard it came back. So, um, so after I did um, kind of the law school, uh, during that time, I when I graduated, I joined Pillsbury Winthrop, Winthrop Shop Pittman as a patent attorney. So I spent a little bit of my time there. Um, and after that, I went to HP as patent counsel and I spent my time there. And now, uh, five years ago, I my co-founder, also a female founder, um, who I met during the time of law firm and HP, we co-founded a company called Bluefoot. And it's patent intelligence um, platform. It's a software platform that we um, use this patent intelligence data to solve a lot of problems, IP strategy problems, um, national security problems, and many other areas where IP is a bit of still a bit of black box, right, to a lot of other areas uh, outside of IP, right? So that's what, what we do, and we're I'm very thrilled to be part of uh, this panel um, celebrating World IP Day, especially for the women creators and innovators, and, you know, like really excited to be a uh, part of this discussion, so. I am another Rachel, Rachel Kaler. Um, I, I admit I'm super excited about uh, the idea of data. I love data. Um, I, I wouldn't say that I myself am a, am a creator or an inventor, but I am definitely a champion of intellectual property. Um, I started out um, in IP as a technical specialist. I had graduated um, with a PhD and I, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. And um, I joined a law firm um, and, and fell in love with patent law. And um, I, I spent some time in private practice becoming a patent agent. Um, I did not become an attorney. Um, and, and I will say that I, I am definitely, uh, I, I like to point that out as a patent agent um, I, and, and a champion of intellectual property and diversity. I, I see one of my roles is um, championing diversity in uh, intellectual property law. 
um, which I believe, at least through patent agents, is one way to do that. And that's not just for women either. Um, and then I went from uh, private practice, and I am now at General Mills, and I am currently, I remain a patent agent, but also um, uh, IP manager at General Mills, and I've been there for about 10 years now. Um, I would say that, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm not myself an innovator, but, but definitely work a lot with our R&D folks. Um, I love working with inventors, and I, 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 I really love when um, I get a chance to, to make a comment. A couple years ago during uh, International Women's Day, I happened to be working with a group of women who were all inventors, and we were talking about filing a patent application with this group of all women inventors. And it was just such a cool moment to make that connection. Um, I'm very proud to say that um, General Mills is working definitely in the right direction of, of increasing women innovators. Uh, we got a ways to go too, but um, we are we're, um, creating a, a, an ecosystem for women to be represented and have their voices heard uh, in the innovative space. Hello everyone, my name is Renee Fossum. I'm a senior director research fellow at Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati, Ohio. I am a PhD chemist I have over 24 years experience working in upstream R&D, and I'm proud to say that I'm an inventor on over 45 granted patents, and I've got applications in progress. Another notable thing about, about my patents is they represent IP that belongs to us that's on the market. So I'm also very proud to say that I and things that I have invented are in our products like Tide and Downey or similar brands around the world that's making money for our company and for and is a good thing for our country. I'm here today, so I, I'm a chemist, I'm an R&D, my day job is invention. But I'm here today because I have a lot of passion for IP. From the time I was a new hire, I realized how important it was that the ideas, the things that I was creating, important to get them protected so that they would belong to our company and eventually make money. The other reason that I'm here is because I have a tremendous passion for training the next generation of women. So I introduced myself, I'm a research fellow. What that means is I am a level four manager on the technologist side. I'm a PhD chemist. When you look at our level four manager technologists, there aren't a whole lot of other people that look like me. I'm working in new materials. I'm working in upstream formulation. I'm designing new products. One of the things that I spend a lot of time on is training the next generation so that the path that I took, which was not an easy one, is easier for them. And that when they get to my age in the company, there are a lot more people that look like them. So I'm thrilled to be here today and happy to answer any questions. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Casey Boucher Williams. I am the founder of The Gentle Pit. We are a clothing and lifestyle e commerce brand um, that, up until recently, was based in Los Angeles, California. Um, but in the last three months, we have relocated back to my childhood home of uh, Corvallis, Montana where I grew up on a dairy farm. Um, and the reason we re relocated there is we have grown to the point where we needed the space. Um, and so now we are kind of, kind of in a hybrid role of, of uh, operating in two states. Um, I am the daughter of a dairy farmer and grew up watching my parents uh, work hard to build the business, th business that they had and just passionately go after a lot of different creative business ideas that they had without fear and supporting each other doing that. And so um, they have definitely been a role model for me in pursuing my own business aspirations. I worked for over a decade in the corporate world um, on the sales side in a primarily male dominated industry. Um, and about six years ago, I scratched my own itch, uh, essentially. I had an idea for um, a product category within the animal rescue world and, and went looking to try and find it on the market and couldn't and just kind of thought, well, if I want it, I'm sure somebody else does. And so let's start taking steps to, to create that. Um, and I'm also an example of, a, of uh, a business that has built our company on our federally registered 
trademarks. We have three, um, and those have all come out of just my own ideations and thinking, oh, this would be cool, and is anybody else doing this? And I could see this emblazoned across t-shirts and sweatshirts, and let's go ahead and register it. So I am so honored to be here today with the rest of these women and look forward to talking about uh, intellectual property and its impact on small business. Well, let's give all of these women a round of applause. Um, To say they are impressive and credentialed and put many of us to shame is an understatement. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce another special guest, Senator Chris Coons uh, from Delaware. Uh, Senator Coons has spent his career in the Senate working across the aisle um, to get the big things done for the people of Delaware. Uh, many of you are familiar with the Bipartisan Policy Center. They've recognized him for his steadfast commitment to bipartisanship and uh, have awarded him uh, its Legislative Action Award. Um, Senator Coons is probably one of the most productive members of the Senate. He's chair of the Appropriations Subcommittee on State and Foreign Operations. He is the chair of the Senate Judiciary Intellectual Property Subcommittee, uh, and he has legislated on numerous fronts from the Defend Trade Secrets Act to uh, some of the most hard-hitting pressing issues of the day. Um, and I will say, as Senator Tillis's former chief counsel and having had the pleasure of working with Senator Coons's team for four and a half years, uh, there are no better uh, partners, uh, no more steadfast friends than the senator and his team to not only this community, but to so many members and staff um, personally. Um, I could go on, Senator, with your accolades, but I know you're a busy man, but thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Wow, a room full of people celebrating World IP Day. If, I mean, really, wow. Like, if you were to craft a dream that I might have had as a young man, imagine in the Capitol, more than two people interested in IP. Fabulous. All we need to do is fan out, tackle senators, and persuade them of the centrality of this undertaking. Um, so, World IP Day. Um, something like 50 million American jobs, something like $8 trillion in economic activities directly related um, to patents. And there are different ways we could characterize trademarks and trade secrets and copyrights. Um, only 13% of American inventors are women. Um, there are initiatives at the Patent and Trademark Office, thanks to the leadership of Director Kathy Vidal and the legislative work of my friend and partner, Maisie Hirono, to try and strengthen um, the community and to broaden the community of inventors and innovators. So um, let me simply say, um, IP is absolutely essential to human progress, to American competitiveness, to invention and innovation. Um, protecting and strengthening our IP system is the work that Senator Tillis and I um, are launched on. One of the biggest moments for me, this is, this is how much of a goober I am. In December, Tom and I, Senator Tillis and I were at an event, he spoke before I did, and he said, it doesn't matter which party is in control. Chris and I and our staff and Michelle Ankenbray and my very talented patent counsel and a DTLE from PTO and a PTAP judge and a Delaware resident and a really, really smart and capable lawyer who's giving me a look that says, stop talking about me. I hate it when you talk about me, which is the mark of genius. Give a round of applause, would you please? Michelle Ankenbray. Senator Tillis's comment was, we will pursue a similar agenda, we will work well together, we will do regular hearings, and we will put our shoulder to the wheel to improve and strengthen our IP system regardless. This is the only committee, and he is the only partner with whom I think I could actually say that, except for perhaps Lindsey Graham on state and foreign operations, where we just finished talking on the floor, and he and I are speaking at a dinner together in eight minutes that's 15 minutes away. So if you will forgive me, I will be brief. I grew up in a state and a community where IP was the center of everything that happened in my community. I wish that were true of every young American. And I thank you to the panel um, for tolerating my very, brief uh, my very brief interruption of what I suspect was a constructive, insightful, and important conversation before I interrupted you. And let me thank the audience for dedicating your time to understanding and strengthening the American IP system. IP is the pathway to our shared common prosperity and a brighter future. Thank you for caring about it. Thank you for fighting for it. And thank you for celebrating it to World IP Day. Well, isn't it wonderful um, 
that we have so many leaders, administrative officials, senators, chairman of subcommittees who make time to come and celebrate not only World IP Day, but the importance of inclusive innovation. And again, I'm uh, so thankful to be here moderating this panel with these amazing women. And I really want to um, start out as a threshold matter and, and maybe ask each of you to talk to us about some of the barriers you've faced in your career. And some of you touched on that, but you know, really lay out for folks here, particularly staffers who may be in the audience, what barriers to innovation look like for women, the challenges you face, because so often um, policymakers may hear that but may not conceptualize what that means. And so I would welcome those perspectives to the extent that you um, want to share with this audience. Maybe we'll go in reverse order. Oh, uh, I, I believe Samantha is going to introduce our two distinguished government guests. Sorry. Um, but yes, maybe we'll start in reverse order this time. So barriers to innovation, I think, um, you know, when we had our, our, our preparation phone call and we were talking about some of the statistics about women and their patents and their inventions and how we need to increase that, I think the barriers to patenting and trademarking and copywriting intellectual property from women are the same, some of the same barriers that exist for women starting their own business. Um, and I'm going to generalize a little bit, but this is also based on my experience working in the corporate world for over a decade, and then also consulting and, um, and talking with women who want to start their own businesses. Sometimes us women, us incredibly talented, smart, capable women that have great ideas, end up second guessing and doubting and minimizing ourselves when sometimes our male counterparts just act and go and do and learn from their mistakes and advance forward. And I think if there was one thing that I could impart to any woman out there who has this idea rattling around in her head for an invention or a trademark or wanting to start a business, it's stop being afraid of failing and looking bad and, and having criticism and judgment and just start doing. Because in the doing, you learn and Maybe you fail or maybe your results don't necessarily look how you think you, that they, you want them to look initially, but that's good data that you can take and get feedback on and use to inform your next step of moving forward. So I think first and foremost, it's taking those thoughts and ideas you have and figuring out your action steps that you can start executing against and moving a little bit more forward and a little bit more forward um, each day until, until you get to your goals. And the other thing that I think is important is having representation and examples of women that have gone before you that have done what you're trying to do. Because if you can see it and if you can see women that have done what you want to do, even if it's not the exact same product or idea, you know it's possible. So I think what we've done here, what the, um, the USPTO and um, all of the, the wonderful organizations have done here today in showing examples of women in intellectual property is so incredibly important for the next generation of women who might think, oh, I'm not sure it's possible, because right here in this room are great examples of how possible it actually is. I would echo some of those comments. So the situation, the barriers that you face in a large company, I don't have to worry about financials. I don't have to worry about finding an attorney. I don't have to worry about having the ability to search prior art because I'm lucky enough to work for a large company that we have all those resources right there. So from my perspective, similar to what um, was said earlier, a big part of what we've seen and what I've lived through myself is what we call this confidence gap, the 90% confidence gap. So women will often want to be perfect, make sure that they are right, make sure that they know it all before they lean forward. And when you have an idea, when you have that creative invention, it's really important that you lean forward and you protect it as fast as you can. You don't need to wait till everything is worked out. You need to have you need to have the idea, reduce it to practice, and then go forward. And what I see between men and women is that men will oftentimes lean forward. And if they hear no, they hear no from an IP manager, no from their manager, no from an attorney, they'll push back. They'll go away and they'll come back and push back. And so what we're trying to train in young women is to be confident in your ideas, to go forward, and to just not be afraid to fail. 
I will, I'm, I'm not going to take the whole time, but we've got some other ideas about barriers. And one of those things that's very similar um, to, I think what we all see is this idea of having role models and being taught and shown the way. IP is a practitioner's skill. Every time you file a case, go through prosecution, go through opposition, you are learning. Every case is different, but every time you are learning and building your skills. When you're a prolific inventor, it's almost like your skills grow exponentially because you become a go-to person when it comes time to file, when it comes time to go through prosecution or opposition. What we're trying to do at PNG is establish more formalized mentoring programs between senior and junior technologists so that they learn early in their career this skill. And, and in fact, if I think back on my own career, that's one of the things that really helped me. So I'm not going to reiterate everything they said. I mean, I, I think it'd be easy enough to to say that that it is a little uh, the confidence gap is a big deal. I will say that I'm I've been very lucky um, in that I didn't grow up with a lot of money. Um, you know, I grew up in a fairly rural area, but I had teachers and family that believed in what I wanted to do, which was not a very traditional girl thing to do. I mean, I. I the curled hair thing is like a really recently learned skill. <laughs> um, and and in in that environment, um, if, if I'd been a little more sensitive to the opinions and the expectations as a girl, I might not be here. I thought I was going to be a veterinarian. And fortunately, I had the I had the good fortune to be able to go to college on a scholarship, um, had access to that um, and uh, discovered absolutely not. That's not what I'm going to do you know, was able to change into something I did love, microbiology, was able to go get a PhD. And, um, you know, all of those things could have been barriers to me, but I was very lucky. And I think those are barriers to a lot of different groups of people, not just women, not just girls, um, but, but the whole spectrum of diversity, getting an education um, and going into areas of, of technology, you know, of creativity that are not traditionally feminine um, can be a barrier. Um, and that's that's one of the reasons I advocate uh, for patent agents and, and building diversity in patent law, um, because number one, uh, you don't need a law degree to become a patent agent. Uh, you can pa practice before the patent office and, and practice patent law. Um, so that's one barrier removed. Um, and another thing is that once you increase the diversity of Represent, representation before, you know, the office, um, inventors can start seeing themselves as being able to approach um, patent law or trademark law. Um, you, you, you can see the, the, the diversity within the law, um, and it becomes less intimidating, um, it, more approachable. So, um, you know, I was very lucky in that there weren't a lot of barriers for, by luck, but I think a lot of people um, do see those barriers, women and minorities, um, and, and uh, finding ways to ensure that women and girls and uh, people of all kinds of uh, diverse backgrounds have more access to things that are not traditionally expected of them that they want to do and support and pursue. I'm going to share a little bit about my kind of experience as a woman founder, some of the barriers that I experienced. Um, so, like, you know, to start the story, uh, you know, you, many of you already may have, have heard like how the, the venture capital market was uh, actually really good last year, like post pandemic, like money funneled um, into the VC market. They had a second highest investment VC money in the US, which was $200 billion. Um, it's a huge uh, money flowing into that market. And then um, Director Vidar uh, touched upon the percentage of women founders get out of that $200 billion um pie do you anyone remember what that number was Sorry. it was yeah it was 1.9 percent of 200 billion dollar going into women founders um it's actually is it trending better over time um when i actually looked up the research before this uh, discussion it was actually trending um 
downwards, right? It was previous year, it was 2.4%. Um, and then it um, it downgraded to 1.9. And one of the uh, women investors uh, kind of quoted that she's like, when uh, economy tanks, discri discrimination feels justified, right? Investors see women founders as a high risk. So the trend goes down, right? Um, and that, but that's a perception. Like, actually, let's look at actual numbers, right? What's that's the perception that women founders are high risk. And I personally felt that too when we were initially founded our company. Another woman founder that I mentioned, um, Ramya Fassad, uh, she, uh, we, you know, made our investment deck and then like showed a lot of people like to pitch them, also get feedback. And one of the angel investors, like, actually. Can you remove your pictures from team slide, right? Um, it will actually decrease likelihood of getting investment if um, they don't trust women founders could do enterprise sales. Um, it was she. He was actually giving uh, feedback from good intent, right? Because he also see this unconscious bias, right? We appreciate the feedback, but we didn't exclude it. We we didn't remove it. <laughs> we still we, it's still there, um, but the Going back to the actual numbers, um, no one talks about actually success rate of women founders, right? We hear about this 2% pie, 1.9% out of 200 billion pie. But if you look at success rate, investments into uh, women founded companies actually outperform all male teams, all male founding teams by 63%, right? It's it's amazing number, right? It's a really, really amazing number. And if you look at this actual success, you know, they say women founders, um, generalizing again, right, uh, tend to care more about company culture. They build a really strong team, lead with empathy, right? And then they also really good with spending their money, right? Like they're allocating their money. Um, they, um, you know, spend less in the areas they could save, you know, they's leading to successful business, therefore 63% of performance that we experience, right? So in my mind, um, we need to celebrate this, right? And then kind of be really vocal about the success that we're getting and re-educate. So I'm really appreciative of the, the WE uh, initiative, um, you know, the Women Inter Entrepreneur Initiative, like really educate people, the success stories that women founders have, so. Well, this is absolutely amazing to hear your stories and, and Rachel particularly hearing, you know, just the unconscious bias that you experienced, you know, as a woman founder of a, a new company. I mean, I think that's very powerful for people to hear and understand that, uh, for many times, some of the barriers you're facing aren't because of credentials. It's not because of your ideas. It's because there's an unconscious bias. And so thank you for articulating that. Um, uh, one thing I think that was common from all of you is talking about mentorship and how important it is to have someone to look to for advice, for guidance, to you know uh, push back and challenge you and encourage you uh, to continue going. And uh, at the Chamber of Commerce, we're lucky. Our members are very supportive of inclusive innovation efforts. As companies large and small, they want to make sure that their talent has the resources they need. And so I'm curious to hear from all of you, how can the private sector engage in effective mentorship um, when it comes to inclusive innovation? Uh, what methods, what resources, what tools, what are the best things that any company, no matter their size, can put on the table to help women like you do what you do best? Maybe we'll start at the other end again. <laughs> I'll keep it short. I think uh, for us, at least our company, you know, I think the psychological safety is really important that have building the trusting environment that whether you're a woman or you're junior or, you know, um, that you could, we provide that safety, right? That they feel safe to be vocal, um, speak up their ideas and Delete ego is one of our core core values. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the the environment that I think foster uh, 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 foster innovation. So I'd like to speak a little bit to um, yeah, creating the environment. So we've all heard of DEI, right? Diversity and uh, equity and inclusion. Um, General Mills recently added as one of our core values, belonging. So inclusion is is. Making room at the table and belonging is is listening to to all the voices. Um, so so actually embracing and making it public what uh, you as a company. So I, I work at a rather large company, General Mills. 
Um, but I think that, you know, large and small, um, and start measuring the things that that um, affect that, right? Um, so, you know, creating a culture of belonging is is super important. And then as the expectation that, that your employees uh, live that value. And when you live that value, then you get uh, mentorships that um, are across the company. So I, I think it's important to remember that um, women don't have to mentor women. I think, you know, women can be mentored by men. Absolutely. Um, you know, bringing uh, women to the table and hearing their voices is in part an invitation by the men who already have access, right? Same with, with other areas of diversity. Um, we don't all have to look alike in order to mentor one, mentor one another. So reaching out your hand and, and mentoring. The last thing I'd like to mention is um, get involved in organizations because where you have professional support, where you can connect, and you know I'm a member of AIPLA, I'm very proud of that. So many opportunities to get mentorship in professional organizations, whether that's AIPLA for those of us who practice intellectual property law, or you know, uh, you know, if you're in uh, uh, chemistry, you might you might join the ACS, um, uh, that sort of thing, where where you get involved in those sorts of organizations and build your professional mentorship. One of the other builds that I have, <clears throat> one of the other builds that I have is, as your role as leaders to be asking, what have you learned? Is there anything interesting here? Just giving that extra little push to have people take a look at results in a different way. Maybe they're surprising, maybe they're non-obvious, but then if they are, there's something to own there that maybe a junior person or an inexperienced person might not know how to do. And then as you become more experienced, open the doors. So I think you mentioned access. So it goes a long way to have a relationship between, between the inventor and the attorney, the attorney and the examiner, and the, and the IP managers and the whole process. When more senior people can pull up individuals and show them the way and role model behaviors and strategies of how to be successful, it can really jumpstart a younger person's career and the ability to get a granted patent. So I think the idea of mentorship can in and of itself be a little overwhelming, especially for somebody like me who, um, it, for the first four years building the company, it was just me. So we didn't have larger corporations with other amazing women working in it that I could kind of um, talk to you directly. And I think that that's important, especially for women out there that maybe you're in rural areas, maybe, I mean, even in Los Angeles, an entrepreneurship kind of by definition is a little bit of a lonely experience. And finding a mentor can be a full-time job. Where do you, you know, there's no mentor store that you can go to and just pick one up on a Tuesday. So for me, I had to find mentors in people that I didn't even know personally, in books, in podcasts, in social media for as much as uh, you know the negative side of social media, there's also wonderful benefits in that you can search and find women who are a little bit further ahead of you or a lot further ahead of you doing what you're kind of trying to do and learn from their examples and, and listen to what they have to say. So um, I would encourage anybody out there who is kind of stuck on, well, how do I find a mentor? Just start, just start researching. Google, Google women in the industry that that you want to be in, or doing the things that you want to do, and read up on them. I have gotten so much inspiration from women-led companies and even and male founders that um, have gone ahead of me that have given. You know, you'd be surprised how much you can learn by just kind of paying attention to what they're posting, paying attention to what they've. Um, written or interviews about them. So I think looking for mentors in non-traditional areas and finding inspiration where you can is is really important. And, oh, absolutely. So <clears throat> one of the things that I'm not sure if there's anyone in the room that can influence this, but I think you've heard a theme of this is hard work and you have to learn how to do it. And we don't teach this in education, whether it is high school, college, graduate school. I have a PhD, Rachel has a PhD. We wrote refereed articles. We did not, for the most part, 
graduate students do not file patent applications. If that is something that we wanted to change together, I think that would be something that would truly make a difference because then these individuals starting their careers, whether they're women or not, already have at least a blueprint of how to get started. So when they have those great ideas, they don't get left behind because they just don't know the process or where to start. That's great. And that actually, I think, segues well into the last question I have, maybe in you know, a sentence or two or less, if you had one thing you wish that could be done as a matter of public policy, you could wave a wand that would help more women become empowered to enter uh, the innovation ecosystem, uh, what would that be? Um, so this applies for innovation business in general. <laughs> it would be to eradicate the idea of overnight success <laughs> and really, really educate women and men about what it actually takes to create something from nothing. And yes, there's this big shiny reward at the end and it's kind of exciting to start in the beginning, but there's the whole middle that can just beat you down <laughs> if you don't have the support and the fortitude and the tenacity to keep plugging away day after day. And so I think, you know, as much as I'm a, a proponent of social media and what it's done for business owners and the access it's given, there's also the downside, which it creates this false narrative of, oh, they started on, you know, this day and look six months later, they have an eight figure company. And that is just not reality. And you know what? That is okay that it's not reality because if you were given everything that you wanted instantly, I, I am so glad I was not given a large sum of money right when I started out with Gentle Bit because I would have. I would have made a lot of mistakes and probably not done a lot of things correctly. There is value in the process and in learning and failing, even though I think failure is just data that you get back and you use it to inform your next step. So I think women in particular, it's really encouraging them that this is a long process. It needs to be a passion. It needs to be a calling, but it's possible if you hang in long enough and keep taking one step after another, because eventually you're going to build momentum and critical mass and you're going to get, you're going to get to where you want to go. Do I get to talk again, even though I already gave one, because <laughs> I have another one. So, um, so other than the education piece, I think one of the enablers would be to speed up the process from filing to grant. I think that is as an inventor, it can take years before you, you see any activity or any movement. And especially so for someone like me in a big company, that's okay, I've got all this ecosystem behind me, but to an entrepreneur or to someone who's trying to get going in white space, it can be the difference, I think, between having a competitive advantage and not. And so I think that's an important thing. Um, I agree with like all of these things for sure. Uh, I, if I were to wave a magic wand, um, I, I would say that we need more practitioners um, that are more diverse to help more people. The current system is not just slow, but also very expensive. Um, and there has to be, um, I mean, we certainly should be exposing younger people to what intellectual property is, what it takes, what it does for you. But we should also have a very clear understanding that, um, you know, of what, how it can be protected. Um, it, it is a, a, a big, more than a bummer uh, when you've, uh, spent a lot of time and energy into an idea um, only to find out you can't afford to get a patent or that once you've got a patent it's easy to infringe or you know a number of other pitfalls right so um, making sure that the system is more accessible and that that does mean more practitioners that does mean um, pro bono that means a lot of things and we're working on that um, but that, that that's more than a sentence or two but um, that's my magic wand to add on to the other things Thank you. Um, so for me, if I had a magic wand, uh, I talked about kind of the, the the founders kind of women founders gap. Um, and I, I think there's a policy changes or public sector kind of uh, stepping it that we could 
um, augment. Like, for instance, we our company is a beneficiary of a Small Business Innovation Research Fund. Um, so we it's called SBIR program, and we benefit a lot by uh, being part of the program, um, actually helping some of the government um, sector work with our patent intelligence. And, you know, I think those programs could be augmented and then really benefit um, kind of the women founders who are trying to survive during that gap, right? Because once you make a certain point, I think the disparity actually decreases, right? The early stage startups uh, by women founders are the most suffering, right? So I think the feeling that gap in between so that we could actually push forward uh, will be will be magic, my kind of wishful uh, magic wand, so. Well, I want to thank this great panel of women. Um, and before I introduce Sam, though, I also want to note there are also a lot of women in this room who may not be on this panel, but have been working on inclusive innovation um, for years. You heard, obviously, from Shira, um, but there are people like Jenny, like Sam, like Marla Grossman in the back. There are a number of women who are here who for years have worked behind the scenes to promote inclusive innovation and to advance policies that make it easier for more people to do that next big thing. And so let's not only give a round of applause to our panelists, but to all the women in here who've worked on these issues. Did you take notes on those policy ideas, ladies? Um, so getting straight to the point, I um, want to talk with my friends in the administration. Um, Liz, we talked about the fact that women currently account for only about 13% of inventor patentees. The USPTO has estimated that if women patented at the same rate as men, GDP could increase by more than a trillion dollars annually. So how can we unleash the potential of women innovators from the USPTO's perspective? Thank you, Sam, and thank you to Brad, our co-host. Um, let me just start very quickly by uh, introducing myself uh, with one word, like our friends Madonna and Cher. I'm going to go with one word, and that's awestruck. <laughs> awestruck at the panel of remarkable, beautiful, talented women that I have had the opportunity to be with today. Awestruck to be here in our nation's capital with a room full of people celebrating and empowering the growth of intellectual property. Uh, Sam, to your question, um, there's so many things we can do, and there are so many things that the USPTO is doing, in fact, to unleash American innovation. And I'm pleased to have the opportunity to amplify the director's remarks in talking a little bit about our WE initiative. Uh, she spoke about it briefly, uh, but uh, she did not share that today, in fact, was a WE Wednesday. Uh, hopefully many of you attended either virtually or in person our WE Wednesday held on our campus where we highlighted six remarkable women talking about the role of mentorship. And this was just one of our many monthly programs for WE Wednesday. WE Wednesday is built upon our 25-year platform of Women's Entrepreneurship Symposium that the USPTO has hosted each and every March, again, for 25 years. We Wednesday has now taken that platform and blown it up in a positive way to have more repetitive uh, information, education, and resources available. So not only do we have our in-person and virtual events being held each and every month, we also have on our website uh, video tutorials from successful women entrepreneurs, founders, scientists, and inventors. We also have our journeys of innovation which tell the stories in writing of these similar remarkable women that we can all learn from. We also have um, a, a number of resources that are available to people of all demographics, no matter what diversity, whether it's geographically diverse, uh, gender diverse, ethnically diverse. And those are many, many tools and resources that are free. Our favorite four letter word, F-R-E-E. -E. Now, oftentimes you have to go to our website to find those resources, but we are trying to be better citizens of the IP ecosystem and trying to better promote those resources. Uh, Director Vidal spoke about our Council for Inclusive Innovation, and that is one of our strongest platforms where we are bringing forth not only education and information, but programs and initiatives to help empower uh, diverse citizens and stakeholders of the IP system. 
She spoke about our accelerated, uh, expedited examination for first time filers, which again is going to help recognizing that oftentimes getting those IP rights takes too long and can, can slow the progress of a startup. There's our innovation uh, interns program where we are bringing in the next generation of students to educate and empower them to understand and appreciate the role and importance of intellectual property. We're starting our very own grassroots campaign where we are empowering our employees to be grassroots educators in their community, IP champions, in fact, to help speak to K through 12 audiences. Uh, as was suggested, we need more education. The US Intellectual Property Alliance in a recent survey surveyed over a thousand Americans as to their understanding and appreciation of intellectual property. The results, not that surprising. People's level of knowledge of intellectual property may be a mile wide, but it's only an inch deep. We have a lot of work to do to change that. And changing it through K through 12, K through 20 education, I think is a great place to start and certainly something that the US Patent and Trademark Office and many of our collaborators, collaborators that are here in this room are working to do. Uh, so it's a great, great opportunity. Um, I know my colleague uh, has not had an opportunity to speak, so I don't want to take all of the time, um, but I do want to have the opportunity to speak about the value of her IP, which we have featured here today, but maybe I can do that in just a moment after Maria speaks. Yeah, so. Maria, why don't you share with us uh, what the Copyright Office is doing to support creative women and any other takeaways that you'd like to share with us? Well, no, thank you very much for having us here, and it's always a pleasure. Um, I think a really important part to remember is that everyone in this room is both a creator and a user of copyright. And copyright, unlike our industrial property colleagues, does not require registration. But I think there's three points I'd really like to leave you with. Um, you know, we have to walk the walk, and under Registered Pearl Butter's leadership, we have a strategic plan that has two key goals, copyright for all, getting the message out to everyone of all uh, communities here in the country and abroad, as well as the enhanced use of data. And as Registered Pearl Butter said, you know, our building out our data is really important because we have to know what we have to so we know where we're going. And so to that end, we've hired a chief economist who's working with the PTO chief economist, as well as colleagues at WIPO and the UK IPO to get that information. We released the report last year, 38% of registrations for the past 42 years are women. Uh, over that trend in time, the women who've been in uh, multi motion pictures has doubled and women who have been filing computer programs has tripled. There's still a lot room to go, but we're also going to be expanding with our chief economist research into demographics because that's sort of the next set. Who else do we have? Where can we target messages? How can we get more people into our system? And I think that's um, another point that we've done is we've created and we've put all this data up on our website. We're going to be encouraging and we do encourage researchers to take that data and start looking at it and examining new ways to help open up the system through at, you know, whether it's small, medium, large, or independent creators. That's really, really important. Um, the final point, outreach and education. It's everything, as we've all been talking about today. Um, we've been involved at the Office of Partnership across not only government, as Shira said, with CI Squared, um, and we're always looking and ready to will to partner up and present to all audiences, large and small, academic, international, you name it. We have to walk the walk, and I think that our office is doing the very best that we can. With respect, we, we've uh, also been working with WIPO, both on the economic side, public awareness side, as in addition to the sort of uh, international copyright issues, which are actually important not only for our creators, but for the world creators. And so I, I want to just you know wrap up and say we realize there's a gap, but we are very excited about the work that we're doing to get the message out for the creators, everyone who's in this audience. And I think we the important part is to uh, steam ahead. STEM education is really important. Let's make sure that the artistic uh, uh, endeavors are also related. So thank you. Only one mic on at a time. Um, so I feel a ton of sympathy for those of you who are standing. So I think I'd like to wrap it up, although I will give Liz one more minute. Um, but I did want to say that um, IPO has uh, is very committed to improving diversity in the innovation ecosphere and that we have a number of resources available for 
innovators and creators in all types uh, uh, who are underrepresented from all types of groups. And um, you can access those on the IPO website. We also do a lot of educational programming, and I will certainly be inviting uh, these ladies, all of these ladies, uh, to join me on panels online that you can join um, in the future. So, Liz, why don't you tell us a little bit about that last initiative, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Thank you for that indulgence, Sam. I'd be remiss if I did not call out the fantastic artwork that's here in the front of the room. Uh, for those of you who are near the back, I hope you'll have the opportunity to uh, come to the front, uh, perhaps during the reception time. These are just a small sampling of the value of her IP that was positioned during this month of uh, April. I I'd like to call out my colleague, Peter Maravani who is the director of the Global Intellectual Property Academy at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. This effort was his brainchild. Not only does it represent nine inventors, creators, beautiful women from the U.S., but there was also participation by 11 countries across the globe, featuring 23 additional women creators, individuals working within IP systems within their own countries. I know we have at least a couple of the women that are featured in the value of her IP here in our audience today. If I could ask them to stand and be recognized. <laughs> These women are our future. These women are the role models for our children, for our times for the generation that we have now and for the generations to come. So we are very, very fortunate to have them. The value of her IP was a social media campaign, our, a, a task to reach out to everyday individuals. It wasn't tasked to reach out to our IP community of stakeholders and professionals. This was to reach people, using Director Vidal's words, where they are. Too many of our citizens, too many of our individuals only see IP as the sticker price. They don't know the late nights, the hours, the failures, the phone calls, the begging, the pleading, the time away from their families. So the value of her IP was an opportunity to highlight just that. So I think it was beautifully done, and I think it's some uh, storytelling that has a lot of longevity to it. So thank you for letting me share that. Thank you to all of these panelists. Each of them is a force uh, in and of herself, and I hope that you'll seek them out during the reception to, to learn more about them. Uh, with that, I will ask Christopher to make his way up, and let's have one more round of applause for these guys. Well, on behalf of the Director General of WIPO, I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, it's, it's wonderful to see the room full after three and a half years. So thank you all very, very much. Uh, I want to begin by thanking Senator Hirono, who helped uh, host this event, along with uh, the Senate IP Caucus, Senator Coons, and Senator Tillis. I want to thank the House IP Caucus as well, uh, Congressman Issa and, and Congressman Hank Johnson from Georgia, um, our partners of many years in government, Shira. Uh, Perlmutter from the Copyright Office, also a WIPO alumna, thank you very much. Uh, Director Vidal from USPTO, thank you very much. Um, our key stakeholder partners, uh, of course, AIPLA, who without, without them, this event wouldn't exist. Uh, I want to especially thank Vince and Megan for all of their work this year. Um, the United States Chamber of Commerce, Patrick Kilbride's support over the years has been wonderful. Um, and I also want to thank all of our, our NGO supporters. I want to thank IPO, who's done so much with WIPO in the area of gender, Lessie, who supported us in the Inventors Assistance Program, um, ABA, which also is, helps us with the uh, Inventors Assistance Program, our partners with INTA, and USIPA. And I also want to thank the panelists. Um, my takeaways from your talk from an agency is that we need to do more in mentoring, and we need to do more in pro bono because without that support, we're not going to make it through the first door. So I think it's very important for us as agency representatives uh, to think of ways that we can do our work better and that we can um, help reduce some of these barriers. Uh, as you might know, our director general has a strong focus on gender equity and underserviced communities. Um, 
the DG being from Singapore, is a firm believer that all of us gain from equity and that the IP ecosystem is going to accelerate growth, innovation, and, and, business, uh, and business activity. Um, the DG, in fact, has created a sector called IES, IP Ecosystems, uh, that has an inventor's assistance program headed by a very dynamic woman named Alison Mage, who is uh, at an event in Brussels uh, today, unfortunately, and not with us. But she has brought a uh, gender focus to the inventor's assistance program. We are working with LESI, in fact, to work on, an, on a mentorship angle and um, watch this space. I hope over the course of the next year, we will, we will have something new to roll out, which will um, at least offer a little bit of an improvement to some of the difficulties we've discussed today. I won't keep you any longer. Please enjoy the exhibits and enjoy the refreshments. And again, thank you so much after three years for being here today.